Hey everyone, this is Brady, the Game Dev Artisan. In this video, we're going to continue our series on the Godot Fundamentals. We'll be adding controller support to move our tank and navigate our UI. We'll also be adding some input scheme options within our game menu, adding controller vibrations when we're firing, and replacing our mouse cursor with a weapon crosshair for when our input scheme changes to the gamepad. Thanks to Godot's input map within our project settings, We'll be able to easily jump right into mapping our controller's input to our existing actions. However, for our weapon rotation, we'll want to create some new actions and mappings to give us a similar behavior to our weapon following the mouse cursor. But to get started, let's add some new events to our input actions for our left turn and our right turn by simply clicking on the add event. And when the event configuration is open, we can listen for input. And with our joystick, we just press left on the left joypad, click OK. On our right, we'll do the same thing. Press right on the joypad. Now for our move forward, we'll use the up and down on the left joystick. So for forward movement, we'll press up. On backwards movement, we'll press down. Now we won't be using the rotate weapon left or right input actions, but instead we'll be creating some new input actions for our right joystick. For now, for our weapon fire, we'll add a new event for the right trigger. And for the weapon aiming, we will add some new actions. We'll call weapon underscore aim underscore up. Add that. And we'll do the same for the down direction, the left direction, and the right direction. And with these new actions, we can map our right joystick for up, down, left and right and last we'll be remapping the controller scheme to our built-in ui actions so if we select this toggle under our ui accept we'll add one for the a button on the xbox as well as the start button now under our ui cancel which we're currently using as our escape key to open our game menu though we may want a better UI name in the future. We'll go ahead and add the back button or select button and confirm that your UI directions, such as UI left, right, up, and down, already should have existing joypad buttons for the D-pad and joystick. If yours don't exist, be sure to add those as well. And that's all the setup we need to do within our project settings. Next, within our game, we'll want to define our input schemes as an enumerator. We'll start with the enum keyword, and we'll call this input schemes. And here we'll have the default of keyboard and mouse. We'll also add support for the gamepad, as well as a potential touch screen in the future. Next, we'll create a static variable called input scheme. It will be of type input schemes and we will just default to our keyboard and mouse. Great, this will allow our game to track and expose a simple way for us to modify our game's preferred control type that we can then later read to modify the behavior of our code. Now to allow us to actually change this setting, let's go ahead and add a new option to our game menu. We open our game menu scene and inside our grid container, we'll add a new child node for a label We'll go ahead and call this the input type label. And also we'll add another child type option button. Go ahead and rename this input type button. Now for our input label, we'll add the text of input type. We preview our 2D view. We can see our new option inside our menu and for the actual options we'll need to add items to our elements we'll first do the keyboard and mouse option second we will use for the gamepad and we'll default to the zero index which is our keyboard so that our input type is selected on keyboard by default now it's important to note that once you've added the input label and the new input type option button, that this affects the focus order of our existing elements. So we'll want to update 
the behavior of our focus based on this element so that it next goes to the main menu button and that it previously will go to our sound effects slider and that the top element again is the sound effects slider and the bottom element is our main menu button and we'll want to update the sound effects slider so that it goes to the button properly instead of our main menu. So our bottom here is no longer the main menu, but is instead our input type button. And the same thing for the next element. And lastly, for our main menu, for it's focused, we'll make sure that the top is set to our input button and that the previous input type button. Next, we'll wire up our signal so that when this input option has its item selected, we'll want to call the input type button item selected function. And inside here, we'll check if our index is not equal to negative one, then we will take our game's input scheme and we will set that equal to our current index, which should map one to one with our input options. Let's make sure inside our game, we type this correctly. Input scheme, Check our game menu, make sure that saves. There we go. Right now we have the ability to quickly change our game's input scheme. Let's go ahead and test that that is actually functioning. We'll add some updated behavior to our tank script. We can open up our tank scene as well. Now inside our process function, we'll be replacing our input direction mapping to discrete axis inputs. We'll start with our drive input. We'll set this equal to the input.get axis function call. We'll pass in the move backward and move forward actions. That will give us the uh, Y axis for when we're pushing up or down on our joystick. Next, we'll be using the turn input to do the same thing using the input get axis. Instead, we'll be using the turn left and turn right actions. No longer need the input direction, so we can go ahead and delete that. And here in our input direction, we'll change this to our respective turn input, which is going to be a float value and no longer a vector. So we don't need to call the dot X or dot Y on these inputs. Now our direction needs to use, instead of our input direction, the turn input. And then for our Y plane, that's our drive input, we'll place that there as well as there. Next, we'll update our weapons rotation. And we'll go ahead and take this, go ahead and cut that to our clipboard. And we will be extracting the behavior into a update weapon rotation function or we can pass the delta to it. Create that function down here. Paste in our existing behavior. Now for this function, we'll be checking our game's input scheme and modifying behavior depending on that scheme. We'll start with our input scheme of keyboard and mouse. And in this case, we'll be using our mouse position. But we'll also be calculating the weapons rotation. But in the case of our input scheme being equal to the game input schemes gamepad, create some new behavior. We'll first set up for the aim direction based off our right joystick using the get vector coming from our weapon aim left, weapon aim right, weapon aim up, and weapon aim down. We'll extract this into its own variable, which we will check if the aim direction, this should be direction, not direct. That is not a vector 2.0, meaning that there is movement on either axis. Then we'll be taking and pulling out the angle from our aim direction, pulling the angle function on that vector. And we will set our weapons global rotation equal to that angle. Now the reason we're using global rotation rather than just regular rotation is because we want the weapon to always point in the direction of our joystick regardless of the rotation of our tank. 
Keep in mind that our tank is the parent of our weapon, and as the tank rotates, the internal rotation of our weapon is relative to our tank's rotation. So setting it globally overrides the default behavior. Great, and now that we have our tank's input being modified based off our input scheme, we we'll want to ensure that our camera and cursor is also moving properly when we've switched to that gamepad scheme. First within our tank, we'll create a new child node of type Sprite2D. We'll call this Crosshair. We'll go ahead and assign the sprite from our cursor as the texture, and we'll bind a reference in our onReady to our Crosshair, as well as add a new export variable that we will call crosshair range. We'll set this to the default of 50. Now this will be similar to our max distance that we're currently using with our camera's positioning. Now we can also inside our update weapon rotation, add after our weapons global rotation, we can take our crosshair and we can set its global position based on our tank's global position, plus a vector taking in the cosine of our angle and the sine of our angle to calculate the distance away at a max range of our crosshair range. This will keep our crosshair's position consistently at our crosshair range based off the rotation angle using some vector math. Next, we'll want to make sure that the rotation of our crosshair, meaning the actual crosshair image, has a global rotation that is equal to zero at all times. Next, we will open up our camera script and do a little bit of refactoring to our process function. First, a great opportunity here is I see that we call if target in multiple places. If we don't have a target for our camera, then we actually don't want to process. So we'll just say if there's no target, then we will just return early, in which case we no longer need the if statements under each match condition. This cleans up our code just a little bit and also gives us room to add in our new conditional check, which is if we are using the mouse blended target mode, if game dot input scheme is equal to the game input schemes keyboard and mouse, then we want to perform our current behaviors. Otherwise, if our game's input scheme is equal to the game input schemes gamepad, we're going to check if our target has a crosshair. And if so, then our target position is now that target crosshair at its global position. Otherwise, our target's position is just going to equal the target position. And if we test that, our controller, we can select start game. As our camera mode changes, as we press escape, select our input type to gamepad, see that our rotation with our left joystick works, driving forward and backwards as well as using the right joystick to aim our cursor. Now, when we changed our input scheme, there was no insight to our cursor manager that the default arrow cursor needs to be updated. So let's go ahead and fix that. A great way to handle this is by using the event bus pattern. An event bus is a singleton that we'll be adding into our project's auto load to make it globally accessible across our game. And its job is to centralize some common signals that we may need to observe or emit from various parts within our nodes. This input scheme changing is a great example where we may want to use this pattern. From within our UI's game menu, we change the input scheme that we want our game to use, but depending on that, we will want to either tell our cursor manager that it can revert the mouse cursor back to default, and then our new crosshair sprite within our tank to become visible. Now first, we'll create a new folder within our resources in our file system, and we'll call this globals. Now our first global that we'll create will be a new script that we will call event bus. Now this event bus will extend type node and we'll have a signal 
of input scheme changed. I will pass in the scheme variable containing the ID of our new scheme. Next, we'll want to register the event bus into our script auto loads, and it'll create a node on our scenes tree root by default. To do this, we can open our project settings, go to the auto load tab, search for the path inside globals. We'll select our event bus.gd, make sure our node name is event bus, and we click add, confirm that it's enabled. And now, to emit our signal, we can return to our game menu and inside our new function where we modify our game's input scheme, we can additionally call our event bus input scheme change signal, call the emit function, passing in the index of the new scheme value that we've changed it to. And now that we're emitting the signal, whenever we change our input scheme, we can set up our various listeners to ensure that they behave based on this change. To start, we'll open up our cursor manager and we'll be updating the update cursor function to check whether or not the state of the game's input scheme is of type gamepad or keyboard and mouse, and we'll revert our mouse cursor whenever we change to the gamepad scheme. To do this, we can just add a check to the input scheme. If it equals the gamepad, then we will be calling our input set custom mouse cursor set the texture back to default null on the cursor arrow type. Otherwise, we'll behave as expected. Now it's important to note that our update cursor is only called when this node is ready, as well as when our size changes on our viewport. So here, we can add a connection to our input scheme changed signal on our event bus by connecting it to a new function call called on underscore input underscore scheme underscore changed. We'll create this function. And it will simply call our update cursor function. It's also important to note that on your input scheme change, make sure that your signals connected function has a variable for the expected input values for the new scheme. I'm prefixing it with an underscore because it won't be used in this case. Next, back in our tank script, in our tank scene, we we'll want to make sure that by default our crosshair has toggled visibility off so that it's hidden by default when we're in our keyboard and mouse controls. But we'll also be adding inside its ready function that the event bus input scheme change will connect to the on input scheme changed function call. We'll create this new function. And here we'll check if the scheme is equal to the scheme's gamepad, in which case we'll take our crosshair and we will show the crosshair. Otherwise, we will hide the crosshair. Now, when we show the crosshair, another important update that we want to do is to call the update weapon rotation the delta of zero. We'll also be modifying it to force the weapon's rotation to update. And we're doing this to make sure that our updated position is not snapping to the mouse cursor, but rather to our current input of our weapon. So we'll also need to make a modification to our function definition. Here we'll add a force update position and we'll default that to false, but we'll be checking if our force update position or our aim direction, in which case we'll be updating the position of our crosshair depending on the rotation of our tank as well as the rotation of our right joystick. And last, for a little bit of fun, let's set up our controller to vibrate when we fire our weapon. Inside our weapon script, at the end of our fire function, we'll add a quick check to our game's input scheme. It's equal to our gamepad. And we can use the input start joy vibration, passing in the device ID, the magnitude of the weak motor, we'll use 0.1 in this case, the strong magnitude value, which is for the strong motor, which we won't be using in this example, and the duration of the vibration, we'll use about a half a second. Now, if our input scheme is set to the gamepad and we fire around, our controller should vibrate. 
now when we run our game, we can see our mouse cursor, currently the cursor icon. When we switch our input type to the gamepad, it switches back to our default cursor. And when we return to the game, our new crosshair icon is statically moving when our weapon rotates. The camera position changes to snap to that crosshair position. And the rest of our joypad input is working. And if you were holding the controller, you would be able to tell the vibration is working when we fire our round. And there you have it. The beginnings of controller support and multiple input scheme options. We've added a variety of controller mappings to our game pads. This includes vibration support. We've also introduced ourselves to the event bus pattern for better signaling and observing of events. Be sure to check out the project's GitHub page for the source code. And if you have any questions or any ideas on how you could leverage these concepts, be sure to jump into our growing Discord community and start a chat. And if you found this video helpful, please leave a like. And if you aren't already, please do consider subscribing. And stay tuned for next time where we look at more options for remapping our controller input within our game's menu. As always, thanks for watching and happy coding.